Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session on the wonderful world, wonderful, wonderful world of hemp building materials uh, with Tommy Gibbons. Um, before we get going, I'll just have a few quick announcements. So um, let's see, I need to share the screen here. All right, so I hope my sh screen shared there. So a um, couple of quick notes on if you're new to this platform to increase your viewing area, you can um, click the green arrow in the chat box to close that box. And then to cr increase the particular Im image on the full screen, uh, to get it to full screen, um, you can click the little four arrow button at the top right of the image and that will make that image go full screen. So as you go through, um, as we go into the uh, slide presentation, you might want to do that. Um, so on behalf of the Northwest Eco Building Guild, we acknowledge that we're all on the traditional land of the first people of this region. Um, we honor with gratitude the land itself and thank the tribal people who have been faithful stewards of the land, water, and ancient history of life here. Um, many of us are attending the summit from other parts of the region. Uh, so if you don't currently know whose traditional land uh, you work and live on, um, we, encourage you, we encourage you to find out. Uh, we've included a link here to help you with that. Um, so thanks for taking this moment with us. Um, we are here today because of our interest in green building. The Guild has an unofficial, most of you have heard this if you've been around the Guild for a while, we have an unofficial motto, pushing the envelope. Um, and on a literal level, we're often talking about that, you know, the physical envelope of a building. But one of the most impactful envelopes we can push is about people, equity, social justice, climate justice, um, so as you attend the various sessions over the next, you know, this week and next week, um, we invite you to keep this aspect of sustainability in mind. Um, and we invite you to be a part of the Guild's journey in helping to bring light to this area of the work that's so critical to building our brighter future for that uh, seventh generation. Um, so we are using the Remo platform. Um, it's a relatively new one, uh, but we have uh, volunteers uh, here from the planning committee that are available to help. Um, but it allows you to move around the space. So the, the image that you're seeing right here is the floor plan. Um, so let me just orient you a little bit, a few housekeeping notes if you're new to this. Um, first, kind of look to the corners. Um, and let's see, in the top upper left of your screen, you'll see a yellow circle. And that area, there's a tips and tricks uh, box. It's like a toolbox that kind of gives you some um, tricks to moving around. Um, there's also a how-to video that might be helpful if, you're, um, if you need sort of an intro. Um, also in the upper left corner, uh, we've highlighted uh, with a purple circle, those three lines. Um, if you click there, you can, um, help to troubleshoot some mic or camera issues. Um, so you might need to select your mic or camera um, from that. There's a drop down there. Um, also in the lower right corner, so if you need help from us, like physical face-to-face uh, -face help, go to that uh, help desk and um, somebody might be able to help you there. Um, and then uh, if you're really having a uh, trouble and we, we need deeper troubleshooting, the lower left uh, corner, there's a help, the need help um, button there. And that'll get you to even deeper technical troubleshooting. So, all right. And then you can see, um, we've highlighted here, uh, the attendees, you can see where people are on the floor plan. And if, if you're needing help from someone, any of the people with this little, uh, a yellow star, those are people who are sort of hosts and they can help you. All right, so with that, now I uh, wanna 
thank our sponsors without whose support uh, none of this would be possible. So our sustainable uh, or sustaining sponsors are King County Green Tools, uh, Dunlumber and Pharos Creative. And you'll see we have uh, numerous supporting sponsors. We couldn't do it without them. I'm not going to read all the names, but uh, familiarize yourself with the names that are on here. And, and of course, our contributing sponsors also. So please thank all of them. Um, and then without further ado, um, I'm going to be introducing our speaker, uh, Tommy Gibbons. He is um, with Hempitecture, and he's going to be telling us about um, hemp, all, all sorts of things, hemp, but hempcrete and hemp wool, I know, are, are two of the things. Um, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Meanwhile, um, if you are needing AIA credits, uh, we will be posting in the chat the um, AIA form, and then... Um, and he'll, I think Tommy might run through the learning objectives as well, but here are the official learning objectives for AIA credits. And with that, I am going to invite Tommy to come up on the stage. And Tommy, um, go ahead and introduce yourself and I'm gonna turn, step off. Okay, thanks, Grace. Thanks for the introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation so you guys can all see this on your screen. Here we go. Okay, hello everyone, and um, hope you're having a good day. Should be the West Coast, but I already saw some attendees that I know are not from uh, the Northwest, so it sounds like we've got great reach on this summit. So congrats to Northwest Eco Building Guild. They do incredible work. Um, even just putting together a presentation platform like this where we can all collaborate is exciting. So I'll be sticking around after this presentation. If you want to meet me and talk in further detail, I am more than happy to do that. that this is what I've devoted my entire career to. I've moved to Idaho to work on these hemp building materials. And so talking about it with people who are also in the industry is, is my number one favorite thing to do. So we are gonna talk about the wonderful world of hemp building materials. And maybe a few years ago, this presentation would have been called, you know, the possibilities of hempcrete or um, the potential fiber insulation. Really the world of hemp building materials is expanding and there's more products than even I knew about just last year. I introduced those to you guys. Some of them have been works with directly to introduce them to you to, so that maybe you can use them in your projects and your buildings going forward. So here we go. So who is Hempitecture? We are a for-profit public benefit corporation based in Ketchum, Idaho. We've been here for now, and we manufacture and distribute hemp-based building materials. In addition to reselling materials for projects all across the United States and Canada, we also train and consult industry professionals. We have contractor training in Idaho where we invite people to come work with us, use our materials, learn our techniques. And then finally, we offer on installation. How would we know how to talk about these materials or recommend these materials if we didn't use them in buildings ourselves and even buildings that we inhabit? In fact, I actually use that same installation that you see in the back there on, the, on my own dwelling. So we have to practice what we preach and I hate this term for our industry, but we have to get high on our own supply and, um, and use the materials to make sure that they are vetted for industry adoption. So who am I? Uh, my name is Tommy Gibbons. I'm uh, the co-founder of Hempitecture. I work with Maddie Mead. I've been the chief operations officer since 2008. And that basically includes everything from installing hemp pool, as you can see me doing in that picture there, to packing up boxes of samples, to um, hopping in a straight truck and delivering insulation to someone, um, to invoicing. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a small operation that we run, but we've had incredible impact on the hemp building industry in the United States over these past few years and very proud to have done so. If you see that picture on the right, that's my business partner and me in a tiny home in Bellingham, Washington, uh, alongside the project we were building at the time, which was the Highland Hemp House. And we lived in that tiny home together for six months and woke up every day and walked outside and started built, uh, adding hempcrete to the house. So 
we truly believe and, and breathe what we're, what we're preaching here. And, and, um, and that, that tiny house itself was made out of hemp green and, and it was great to live in for the entire summer. Um, I also want to add, you know, I don't have a building background. My business partner, Maddie, he spent five years building high end residential out in Sun Valley, kind of learned soup to nuts, framing to finish carpentry. Whereas myself, I come from a background of startups, new products and, um, operations. So I've taken that background, merged it with my business partners, uh, building experience and, and hash temp protection into the company that is today with the information that we have to share with you. So here is our problem. And I doubt this is going to be controversial or surprise to someone who's familiar with the Northwest Eco Building Guild. But unfortunately, it's a pretty novel to a lot of the construction industry that's stuck using conventional materials. So building materials have been chosen and decided upon without any regard for human health or the environmental impact. So that means we have construction materials that can be toxic and have huge carbon footprints, and we'd be none the wiser because it's not something that the market demanded of building material manufacturers, and it's not something that um, architects necessarily look to spec when they were choosing materials. We choose based on cost, based on aesthetics, based on availability, but we don't always think about what's this product's impact going to be to the health of the inhabitant and what's this product's impact going to be to the environment that we live in. And a step further, we measure operational efficiency, but we don't often talk about embodied efficiency. And by embodied efficiency, I mean the embodied carbon of a building material. So we're left with building materials that can be underperforming or meet somewhat operational efficiency performance, but they carry with them significant embodied carbon because that's not something we measure ourselves on. We might measure how much heating and cooling we do in a season but we don't think about the embodied carbon putting that building there, or we haven't historically. So here's the solution that we offer. We offer hemp-based building materials, which are healthy plant-based materials that absorb carbon dioxide during the growth cycle of the hemp plant and store that carbon in the time of the building. And these products are also high performing with the ability to make homes more energy efficient, more comfortable, indoor air quality, and less um, variation in indoor, indoor air temperature between the day. So just some stats, I mean, you can imagine why hemp is a good feedstock for building materials. If wood works and wood offsets CO2 and hemp can grow much more densely than wood and can grow much faster than wood, then you can be much more efficient with um, how much CO2 and, and plant matter you're harvesting when you switch from traditional lumber to hemp-based products. And so that's kind of the magic sauce is how fast the hemp plant is able to grow on a renewable basis with limited amount of water. And it can completely replace in a lot of instances, the need for hemp based uh, uh, wood based products. And that leads to a healthier home, happier people and a more sustainable planet for all of us. And so how the, the problem in the building industry, and, and this is something that I'm sure is very apparent to you guys, there's a change coming because we're no longer talking about operational efficiency when it comes to buildings or what type of power is power in the building, whether it's coal fired or solar. We're talking about what was the environmental cost of getting those building materials to the job site and installing them. Did they have to be shipped from an overseas country incurring huge shipping CO2 pollution? Or did they have to be kilned like concrete in a, to a high temperature releasing a lot of uh, carbon in the process as well as heat uh, necessary to, to kiln the material. And so this is something that basically every green building platform is talking about. I just screenshotted, you know, articles that you could find um, on any Google search. Architecture 2030 talks a lot about embodied carbon and that and, and what's wrapped up into our building industry. And then there's even a carbon embodied carbon calculator. Um, the building transparency organization uh, has created this tool that's collaboration between a few different people so that you can actually see the embodied carbon of the materials you're choosing. And, you know, I predict that in the near future, we're basically going to be looking at nutrition labels on building products saying like this has this much embodied carbon. Um, it had to travel this far to get to your job site. And um, here's what you can expect to produce in, in energy and carbon in the installation of the material, because the more we know about our building materials, the more responsible we can decisions we can make and to buildings we build. Right on. So why hemp? And, and this is, again, we talk about the special sauce. It's a rapidly renewable industrial hemp plant. And so it's growing not for flour and not even necessarily for seed or grain, 
but you're growing for that stalk and fiber that makes up the inner part of the hemp. And so we use industrial hemp because not only is it uh, renewable, easily domesticated, um, but it's actually a very high performing material. And there's properties about hemp that you can't get in other, um, in other vegetation crops. So, and here's another uh, consideration that we didn't have, haven't had until recently with the forest fires and just increasing construction damp demand. We've seen wood prices increase astronomically, whereas hemp prices, if farmer recently, they're set, hemp prices are going way, way down. So we're getting more and more supply of hemp. The supply of wood is decreasing in a way that we can't um, replenish it in, in enough time. And so hemp is an alternative to a lot of building materials that can be in the house. All right, so the original hemp-based building material, and you probably heard about the work uh, even coming to this presentation, and hopefully you heard about it from Hempitecture, it's hempcrete. And hempcrete, hemp lime, uh, there's a lot of different terms for it, but basically what you're making is a biocomposite using the inner wooden core, the shiv of the hemp plant, with some type of lime or clay oxide-based binder. Between those shivs together, because the shiv is super absorbent, it's able to absorb the lime and then stick to you efficiently. And that is hempcrete. And that can be used for insulation and infill. It is not a structural material. If anyone is claiming that you can make hempcrete roads or hempcrete pillars, um, they are, mis they are misrepresenting the material's uh, properties at this point. It only provides racking strength and insulation uh, value. It's not a structural material. And if you're curious to see how it gets installed, I've got a quick little video for us here. It'll be a small screen for a second. So I'll walk us through. This was the Highland Hemp House in Bellingham, Washington. About as northwest as you can get. It was actually a slant participant in 2018. That's the three before class three, the finished house is still high class three. That's me adding the water. Tommy, the, the video is too loud. We can't hear you talking. All right. That's good feedback. Thank you. <laughs> if you could turn it down and start again, that would be great. Okay. All right. Let's start again. There's the finished plastered Highland Hemp House. You can see the solar panels on top. There's the hempcrete before plaster. That's the mixer we use. So we'd introduce dry hemp. Then we would make a binder slurry by combining a limestone binder, pozzolan, and water. We would add the slurry to the hemp. That's hempcrete right there. You allow it to mix for a few minutes. And probably the biggest challenge of this project was transporting the material to the wall. And so you can see we put it in blue buckets and then we would set it up a conveyor belt to transport it to the upper floor. And these conveyor belts were very helpful in speeding up the operation because most of a hempcrete project is labor. It's the materials are expensive, but the labor can be three to four times the cost of materials. And so we were always focused on how do we do this as efficiently as possible, mixing, forming, and just adding that woodwork you see there. So you're creating a cavity for the hempcrete to fall into, and then ultimately packing where you're tamping the material into the form and creating the shape that you want it to have for the lifetime of the building. And so these were 12 inch walls. The studs were four inches on center. So you have four inches of hempcrete at the outside of either part of the studs. And so you have a 12 inch hempcrete installation wall, which gives you roughly R25. And there's a beautiful sunset over the bay in Bellingham. And we, we definitely encourage you to go meet that. And that was the tiny house right next to it that I told you guys we were living in. Great. There you got that. And now let's go full screen again. So hempcrete is a great material, but it's a little bit niche because it's not installed traditionally the way most installations are installed. You're planning for a thicker wall from six to 12 inches. Uh, it takes time for the material to cure and dry before you can add plaster. And most people don't really know how to work with it. The materials are, can be hard to find. So it's a little bit of a niche product. But for those 1% of people that are really trying to be as most, you know, passive house, huge thermal mass walls, um, high indoor air quality, uh, hempcrete is a potential answer for them. And especially if they're looking to add uh, fire resistance to their wall. 
We're the only company to have done an ASTM E84 test with hempcrete, and it scored a perfect zero in the flame spread and smoke develop index, which is only this has only been accomplished by rock wool for an insulation material. So it's that lime component inside the hempcrete that really makes it impervious to uh, to flame, which is highly desirable in a lot of um, fire prone areas. So here's again the look at the, the technology we used for cast in place hempcrete. That was just one way to install the material. And like I said, it took a lot of labor. And so we were looking for ways that we could increase the efficiency of the process from using conveyors to using winches to, to raising up the hempcrete as we were um, bringing it to the wall. Packing tools that we could bring alongside the inside of the form board and pack the hempcrete into that wall cavity. And then that top left picture is the two mixers working in synchrony uh, with both the binder slurry and the dry hemp. And if you're looking for more information on cast in, hemp, cast in place hempcrete, uh, we just did an awesome project in Texas. It was a, it's called the Minka project. It was a Japanese barn that was 300 years old, deconstructed, brought to Austin, Texas, reconstructed with the uh, Japanese carpenters who were flown over to reconstruct it. And then that entire frame was cast in hempcrete. So you can see those beams running through um, and coming out the side of that wall of the hempcrete. Those are the original Minka beams, which are 300 years old, and they'll be preserved inside the hempcrete. And if you're also a building, uh, I don't want to say geek, but a building aficionado maybe, I would definitely encourage you to check out, Matt Reisinger did a video on this project. He really covered soup's nuts, the construction of the hempcrete portion. And um, he has an awesome building channel. So just that video alone has brought a lot of eyes and a lot of interest to hempcrete and, he and the hemp building industry. But cast in place hempcrete is only one way to skin the cat. There's panelized hempcrete, which we've experimented before. You can see how that looks. Line up all the panels uh, flat on the ground. Then you pour hempcrete into the panels, pack it down. It's a very fast pour process because you're not having to uh, climb scaffolding and dump material and then pack it. You're just from the mixer directly pouring into the forms and then you're raising up those forms onto the job site. So this was a small cabin we did uh, a couple of years ago in the panelized form. And it really does decrease the labor time by about a fourth. So it, it's intensely fast and efficient. Then there's spray applied hempcrete. There are several pieces of equipment that spray hempcrete and we've been dealing with one spray machine called the Eurezi. That is special because it takes already mixed hempcrete and you're hooked up to a really high powered air compressor and you're projecting the hempcrete against a form board. You can see we have a grid on the interior of the wall there. That's to make sure the hempcrete doesn't fall away from the form. You're spraying it in with an intense speed. So it hits that cavity bonds around the mesh, and it stays there for the lifetime of the building, and then is finished with plaster. We did this building in five days. If we were doing cast in place, it probably would have been like a 25-day project. So it's it's a very efficient and fast way of installing hempcrete. It is a little bit loud, and you can imagine that when you're spraying hempcrete, you're going to have a little bit more of a rounded, um, natural aesthetic versus if you were casting it directly into a form of a much flatter plane but the spray machine is certainly a, it takes a lot of hours out of the project. And there are other spray machines out there, mostly in Europe that combine the lime and the hemp after the nozzle. So they shoot out dry hemp with binder in midair, those two things combined, and then they um, reach the wall and stick to the wall. Uh, I don't see a lot of use of these uh, spray machines and I haven't seen in the United States yet. Um, probably because they're a little bit finicky. You have to have the right amount of binder coming out, the right amount of hemp coming out. And so it's a, it's a little bit of a trickier uh, installation process. And then there's insulation blocks. So these are blocks that are pre-made. They're already cured and dried. And they can just be stacked upon one another with mortar. And uh, they're also an efficient way to install hempcrete. You're taking out the waiting time for plastering. They also are not structural, uh, just like a sprayed or cast or panelized hempcrete, um, but they are gaining popularity in Europe and there's actually, so let's talk about some block manufacturers. So ISO hemp is probably the biggest manufacturer of hemp-based building products in the world, I would say at this stage. 
they make ice uh, hempcrete insulation blocks. They make them in all different um, dimensions and widths, I should say, from a, as short as like three or four inches all the way to 18 inch thick blocks. They also do something pretty clever and you can see the hold block and the U block on that technical data sheet there on the screen. Those hold blocks have uh, cylindrical holes inside of them. You stack each block on top of each other with the cylindrical hole in the same place. You insert rebar and you come back and you pour concrete inside the hold block and that creates the, um, the structural frame. So it'll go from the wall inside of all of the hempcrete. You basically have a formed uh, cylindrical pier. You can also use the U block, which has a U channel and you stack those around um, a certain height of the building, pour concrete inside the U, and that is like a ring around the building that provides your shear strength. So you can have both uh, your load bearing and your racking strength covered with um, those specialty type of blocks. So they're an exciting company. They're out of Belgium. We've toured their facility. Um, they're actually removing their old facility and upgrading to a 7 million euro facility to keep up with the increase in demand and and we're a reseller for their installation blocks in the United States. We have a project in Bozeman, Montana, currently underway that's using isohemp blocks. I think they're a promising way for large projects to use hempcrete just because it takes out that on-site mixing and installation factor. A little more close to home, there is Just Biofiber. And Just Biofiber also makes hempcrete blocks. And I'm not familiar with the product, I haven't used it, but I think we'd be remiss to not acknowledge what they're doing. They've done some projects out in British, uh, out of British Columbia. Um, these are structural blocks now. You can see those green pegs of plastic inside the hempcrete. Those are the structure inside the building. So they're like in Lego-like fashion stacked on one another. And they do have structural, both uh, load bearing and shear strength for those blocks. Um, so it's an interesting product. I haven't heard much out of them recently for development, but I, I, I do think uh, they were onto something when they started that years ago because uh, MCREED's not structural, so if there's a way to make it structural as well as insulation, you're cutting out the need to uh, add structure to your building. Okay, now let's talk about hemp wool, which is probably the second most popular um, hemp insulation product and probably soon to be the first most popular. It's made from 92% hemp fiber, I'm holding a sample right now, and I actually, you can see our wall uh, is insulated in that far corner with hemp wool. This all used to be hemp wool up until last week when a uh, local builder came to us and we helped renovate a, a cabin up at 9,000 feet, and they wanted to install insulation in it for the first time. This cabin is from the 1930s. It was like a ski outlet hut, and so we were really so excited to be part of the project. We said, yes, we'll happily donate materials for rehabbing this U.S. Forest Service cabin. And then we're like, oh wait, we don't have insulation. So we had to take it out of our wall, which we loved having in the office because it's great sound and thermal insulation. And we hiked it on backpacks up 3,000 vertical feet, installed it, and then came back down. And so now we're waiting on replacement insulation. But um, it was for a good cause, so no shame there. Um, but hemp wool is very, very exciting. It's very light. It's a one-to-one -one replacement with fiberglass or mineral wool fat insulation. It comes in widths of 16 inches or 24 inches, and um, it comes in varying depths from two inches for like a van insulation to seven and a half inches if you were to want to insulate a roof or something like that. And just in the past year, we've had over 50 hemp wool customers, many of them in Seattle, Portland, Northern California area for sure, um, as well as even the East Coast. And we distribute from Salt Lake City, uh, Utah, and we keep inventory in stock. So here's a project video of Hempool in action. This was kind of our flagship project we did in January of this year, um, back before the world kind of turned upside down. But it's it's pretty beautiful, so I'm gonna let you guys digest it. So this project took about five days. It's a fairly large house in Venice Beach, California. Um, informally, Olson Kundig was the architect of this project, so it was great to introduce an architecture firm with that standing to the material. They were extremely happy with the product. Uh, you'll notice we're not wearing gloves. It's completely non-abrasive, non-toxic. Um, it's easy to work with. And you're just cutting it with a, a metal, fitting it into, into the cavity studs for a table saw like that. It doesn't take training to work with, really. Any 
general trade labor or installation installer will know exactly what to do with it. And uh, it certainly goes faster than installing a temperature project. And when you consider the insulation value per inch, it's actually a more efficient insulator than that. Uh, the one thing and one caveat I should mention with Hempel is it does not Tony? have the fire resistance Tony, of Hempcrete. Do you think we can, mute, can you mute the video or turn the sound off? Sure. Great, thanks. Such a good track, though. I hate to, I hate to stop playing that. <laughs> but um, so that was the Hempel in action, and it is, like I said, a little bit more of an insulating, higher R value per inch than you would get with hempcrete. But um, you are losing the fire resistance of hempcrete. Hempcrete with that lime binder really is impervious to flame, whereas hemp wool is just a raw natural fiber mixed with a little bit of polyester. It absolutely will ignite. So you want to be careful um, how, your how your wall is assembled to make sure that there's fire resistance on at least one side of the wall. It is class A fire rating though, we will say that. So how does hemp wool compare to other insulation materials? Well, you guys are probably familiar with what's out there. There's things from spray foams or expanded polystyrene, um, cellulose and fiberglass and rock wool. And what hemp wool was really nice for is not only is it good for the environment, but it's good for the installer. So you're dealing with a natural product that's non-abrasive. So it's very easy to install whether you're going to do the installation yourself or you're going to have it outsourced to a builder. And of course, it actually embodies carbon, which not many materials can say they do that. Cellulose, you know, coming from recycled paper, uh, has embodied carbon. But most products like rock wool is an extremely carbon intensive product to make. If you don't believe me, just ask the plant in West Virginia that's getting built right now. I did a hempcrete project in uh, Harpers Ferry, West Virginia in June. And I toured around the, the, the town and they had a, a rock wool plant going in only of the town over and every single person's lawn had say no to rock wool signs on it. Like it was an election and they had www.toxicrockwool.com. And I, so I went to that website and it's the entire community has gotten together to try and oppose the, this rock wool plant because when they're smelting that basalt fiber to make the rock wool, it's emitting gases that are, it's next to a school. It's a, it's a whole problem. But so, you know, you, you, you need to look at, and, and that's the funny thing because, you know, rock wool is a great product. Uh, it's got great fire resistance. It's, it's an insulation material. And so it's often marketed as a green material. But when you look at the production of that product, it really is anything but green. And the same thing can be said for the spray foam and, and polystyrene products. So here's some specs and, and, and technical data. Um, you know, we advertise the hemp wool as $1.25 per square foot for R13. That's roughly 15% more expensive than rock wool. There is shipping on top of that from Salt Lake City and um, $1.75 for R20, five and a half inch. So that's basically right on building code. Um, R20 is typically what's asked for for two by six construction. If you're in Seattle, it's R21, which is a little bit frustrating, but maybe you have R1 in your wall assembly somewhere else to, to meet that threshold. And that is actually the exact same insulation values as fiberglass. So any project that was about to be installed with fiberglass um, can be switched to hemp wool just like that without really changing the changing um, the insulation value. And that's happened to us. We've had customers that were just about to insulate with fiberglass or rock wool or sheep's wool even, and then they find out about hemp wool and, and we sub our product in and, and, and they leave happy. Um, just some of the ASTM testing that you can see there, uh, the thermal resistance at ASTM C518, that's R3.69 per inch, so roughly R3.7 per inch. It's a highly permeable uh, insulation. It's incredible at wicking moisture. The fiber of the hemp plant is responsible for transporting water up and down the stalk. And so that explains why it's really good at taking um, vapor or moisture and it kind of diffusing it through the panel. And so you'll never get a soppy piece of insulation and you won't risk any mold. You won't have any pets or uh, pests or rodents or insects inside the wall. Um, moths is a big problem for Havelock insulation or sheep's wool insulation. That's not a problem for hemp insulation. And so it, it really does everything you want an insulation material to do. And you'll also see it's class A fire resistance from the ASTM E84, but it, it, it is not a zero, it's a 20. So you do get some flame spread and some smoke development uh, from igniting it, but, it, but uh, it still makes that class A rating. And these panels, um, I mean, I, I pull it out of the wall. They're, they're four feet long. 
And they again, they come in 15 and a, and a quarter inch width or 23 and a quarter inch width. And that's designed to be pressure fit inside your stud cavity. Here's a, another building material that is hemp based. And so now I'm getting into building materials that we don't, well, we actually do resell the clay board, but these are manufactured in Germany, the Lemmix clay board. It's a natural clay that's cast around a fiber mesh inside of the, the, the panel. And so these are drywall replacements. So one thing that you're thinking of when you want to do green construction, I mean, drywall, not only is it very susceptible to mold because of the paper facing on the drywall, but it is a high body carbon uh, product because it's basically casting cement or and gypsum in between two sheets of paper. And um, that's not going to lead to a low body carbon footprint for the house. This is clay that did not have to be kilned naturally occurring clay bonded around a natural plant fiber, giving it that tensile strength. And it's a very nice vapor open product. So the clay board can be used, of course, with hemp wool, but it also works with using with hempcrete because um, it's vapor open and hempcrete cannot be closed in with a, a vapor impermeable membrane. It needs to be able to breathe and allow a water and moisture exchange inside and outside. So, that's the fact sheet right there. It comes in 16 millimeters, which is roughly five, six or five eighths of an inch and uh, 22 millimeters, which is roughly seven eighths of an inch. And so we're working with them to actually have this size appropriately for the U.S. studs, stud widths, because the cavities are a little bit of a different size in Germany. Um, but we've already brought some material over that. That hand is on a panel that's been brought to Austin, Texas. We see ourselves using a lot more in the often, a lot more often in the future because People come to us, they look for clean uh, plant-based building materials. We can offer them insulation, um, but we want to be able to offer them something that's going to replace their drywall. And maybe one day we'll be, able to, we'll be able to offer them something that replaces their um, vapor barrier as well. Okay, moving forward from Limix Clayboard, hemp wood. So hemp wood is manufactured in Murray, Kentucky. I have a sample right here. Of it, and this is the only building material product that's manufactured in the United States. And so I think it's an important company to watch and, and see the traction and progress of. I really build this as like an oak replacement. Anywhere you'd be using oak, use hemp. It grows faster, it's more renewable, it's um, higher carbon absorption per time spent in the field. And you're able to make all these engineered wood products. So they do floor, furniture, as well as dimensional lab, uh, lumber that is non structural. And what they're doing, you can see, is they, they're individually breaking down the fibers and then they're pressing them together with a um, non-formaldehyde non resin. So a very interesting company. They're the only U.S. manufacturer. They're using American hemp, which is a little bit rare at this stage. A lot of builders, including ourselves, are dependent on Canadian or overseas European hemp um, as processes are, are coming online slowly but surely. And the hemp wood is already using American grown hemp, processing it in-house, making these wood products. And they do some really interesting things from getting a whole floor or tabletop counter made out of hemp wood to even just like a furniture frame. So it's it's a pretty interesting material and I think they'll expand from there. They're kind of following the bamboo flooring model. And um, founder today, and he's talking about how getting lead points for using the hemp wood in, in all these different building projects. So I do think it's a green building material to, to keep an eye on. Here's Canagrove, a little bit of a similar product to hemp wood, um, also made with U.S. hemp. They're calling it Canaboard, hemp board. Um, this is made by a company based in Los Angeles. Uh, it's basically like an MDF, medium density fiber board replacement. So not structural, but if you're doing cabinets or um, shelves or something like that, it's a totally viable option. And you, again, you're just replacing those wood fiber pieces with, um, with hemp fiber pieces. So this is the Hemp Building Summit, and I have to let, put this on your guys' radar because if you are interested in learning more about hemp building, um, this is going to be the place to come because we're going to have to – last year we did an in-person event in Ketchum, Idaho. 300 people turned out for the first event of its kind. The flights from Boise and Salt Lake City were filled with people who just couldn't get enough talking about hemp and hemp building materials, and the attendees included – Growers, processors, architects, construction workers, designers. It was it was really everyone coming together for the first time and realizing that this is an industry in the United States that is gaining steam and gaining attention. 
because it's the building product that people are kind of waiting for. They're waiting for those um, carbon negative renewable products and maybe something that demands less wood given how much uh, strain there is in the wood market right now. So that'll be on the 24th. It's a virtual platform. We're going to be touring different international manufacturing facilities. I mentioned um, Isohemp. There'll be a tour of Isohemp inside that uh, summit. We'll be touring houses in Ukraine, um, projects from all over the United States, as well as talking to builders uh, based in the U.S. and in France. It's going to be a real soup to nuts. So if you have zero experience in hemp building or you feel like you're a hemp building aficionado, uh, it's worth turning out for because there's going to be networking inside the program, a DIY, get your hands on hempcrete, build it yourself portion. Um, so if, if you liked what you were hearing today at any point, then I totally encourage you to, to continue with the Hemp Building Summit because that'll be an even deeper dive into a lot of the companies and products I've mentioned. Hempwood is a presenting sponsor for the summit. So it's it's everyone in the industry coming together and checking in and kind of a screenshot of where we are because we know that in years to come, we'll have a, a high trajectory moving forward from here. And then I should also say the United States Hemp Building Association. So this is a 501c6 trade association that's created by the builders, the growers, um, the processors coming together and, and being on the same team so that we can promote this industry in the United States and make it at least somewhat of what our European predecessors and Australian predecessors have been able to accomplish. So if you are interested in, in, in networking, meeting group builders in your area, uh, potentially finding a hemp supplier or processor, I encourage you to have a corporate or individual membership with the USHBA. It's a very young organization, but just over the first year, they've gained over 200 members. Um, and a lot of people have uh, looked to them to provide leadership going forward in this industry. All right. So that is going to be it from me. I know I just brain dumped a lot of products and, and information. So I will absolutely open it up for questions and stay for as long as there are questions. Um, but if you're interested in keeping tabs on what we do on this industry, uh, we really try and do our best to not only service customers and build projects, but also be industry leaders and, and thought leaders for the hemp building space. So if you're on our email list, you'll get information from us and updates about the new products we have offering and, and the new projects that we are completing. I'd absolutely encourage you to come to contractor training if you're a builder and you think that you want to start offering hempcrete installation or hemp wool installation. Uh, come to our contractor training. We have one spot available in November, one spot available in December, and that's a great place to kind of get your hands dirty, gain confidence with the material. We'll cover everything from the technical specifics of working with hempcrete to framing and window details to uh, estimating your labor and material costs for a project and um, give you basically all the resources you need to confidently offer this as part of your building practice. Again, attend the HBSV. You can do that from the comfort of your own home. Saturday the 24th, um, the, the tickets are on sale now. We're no longer selling the DIY block kits. Uh, we just finished <laughs> shipping all those out yesterday, and so we, we are not accepting any more orders for those. Um, you can feel free to reach me over email or text. Phone calls are not good. I, I don't answer many phone calls. Those go right to voicemail if there's any space in my voicemail. Uh, but feel free to text me, 973-943-9239. Um, I'm happy to talk about this and, and get information out there and make sure that I'm a resource for the people who want to learn more about this because there's a lot of information about hemp building materials out there. And uh, even though this presentation was the wonderful world, there's a not-so-wonderful world of um, alternate information that thinks that you can make hempcrete swimming pools and roads and, and skyscrapers. And so I'm out there to, to be a good force for helping people find information and find builders in their area and, and find locally sourced materials uh, that will make their hemp building projects a success. And I'd have to say definitely follow us on social media as well. Um, my business partner handles all the photography there. You can see I'm kind of more of a business development person rather than a, an aesthetic here with the images I've chosen. But um, follow us on social media. You'll see some really high end photos of hemp buildings and hemp building products, and you'll be able to see this industry as it evolves. So, Grace, that's all I've got here. I haven't had a chance to check the chat, see if questions have come in, um, but I will pause there and, and, and wait to hear. Yeah, thank you so much, Tommy. We have a bunch of questions. 
Um, so I will just say them. Since this is being recorded, um, we want to make yeah. sure we say the uh, questions. Um, so I am, so attendees, um, you can vote up questions, just so you know. So um, that way I will address, if we do run out of time, I'll address the questions that have the most votes. Um, so uh, let's see, Tom Balderson had a question. What if part of the wall is below grade? Could it be hempcrete with full and proper drainage plus drainage mat plus drain rot? Question mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you do not want to expose hempcrete to persistent moisture. So even if it is above grade, you need to have some type of weatherproofing, whether it's plaster or a rain screen or something like that. Below grade is a difficult place for hempcrete to live because you're risking moisture coming from um, the earth as well as the, from the basement. So capillary moisture. So whenever we're installing hempcrete, we want a capillary break for the hempcrete to fall on. Usually that comes in the form of like a vapor barrier, or like a bicorp. And if you were on the outside below grade, I almost think it's it would be it would be impossible to keep the moisture from the earth reaching that hempcrete. And any type of persistent moisture that's not able to be breathed out or expelled eventually um, leads to the degradation of the lime. You know, this is calcium carbonate. If you imagine you're walking into a cave and you saw the stalagmites hanging down from the, the ceiling, that's just water um, eroding limestone, which it will naturally do over time. So below grade is a difficult place. If you had um, some type of vapor impermeable barrier, a little bit of a gap so that, and then you were still below. So your, your grade is here, you're sinking down, you're cutting out, your hempcrete installation is here with a, a small vented gap and you're protected from direct moisture exposure, and you're just using it as an insulation, that's fine, as long as you protect it from that repeated uh, moisture exposure. Okay, great. Uh, let's see, the next question, um, I think this is anonymous. Uh, how would hepcrete behave in a renovation that requires cutting into the building envelope? That's a good question. Um, the, Belling, the Highland Hemp House in Bellingham was a renovation, retrofit, and so, and actually hempcrete was designed originally to be a renovation material. In France, when they were adding insulation to old masonry buildings, they would tack on, you know, four or five or six inches of hempcrete to increase the insulation value. Um, one thing you need to know is if you've got wires and um, MAP inside the wall, you can't, you need to be aware of the corrosion power of lime. So everything that's inside of the wall that we're casting hempcrete around is either coated in, in uh, zinc oxide uh, paint or it's in smurf tube to resist corrosion from that lime. So if you were just putting, adding hemp, if you opened up the wall cavity through in hempcrete and there was just a lot of plastic filament wires, you may risk the corrosion of, the, of those wires. You, you would need some type of, um, tube to protect them from but otherwise you can absolutely open up a wall and install to make sure you are not then closing off the vapor permeability of that wall because you're sticking a wet hempcrete in there and it, with drywall that moisture's got nowhere to go and you just kept the moisture in the hempcrete and eventually it could uh, fade. all right great let's see Next question. I you might have already answered this, but I'll just just in case somebody else wants to know this. Um, how long does hempcrete take to cure? That's a good question, and it depends on your binder formula. And I didn't talk too much about binder specifics because it's the same principle accomplished with different products. Um, you're looking at at least a week's time for a hempcrete wall to dry. Now, if you're going thicker, if you're adding more water. If you're in a very humid, damp environment like Bellingham versus Idaho, um, it may take longer for the hempcrete to dry. But really what you're looking for is a hempcrete that has a point where it's going to be a dry surface to receive the plaster. There's no more moisture inside the mix that's trying to get out. Um, so it is a little bit of an art because you, of course, don't know how wet the, the inside of that wall is until you drill open and find out. Um, but at least a week and sometimes as much as a month for cure time wow. before returning for plaster. Wow. So easier to do maybe in our summer months. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. And, you know, you need to be conscious of the temperature because if you're casting hempcrete and it gets down to 30 degrees at night or 25 degrees at night and you don't have it covered or you don't have heaters on it, um, 
that will the water inside the hempcrete will freeze, and then that will undo any bonding that's taking place. As this is from Belgium, by the way, so this is a, a precast hempcrete block. So you can imagine just stacking uh, several of those on top of one another inside your wall cavity. Great. Okay, next one. Um, why does the BioBlock company use plastic for structure instead of something more sustainable? My guess is if they were to use something metal, if that is more sustainable, um, they would um, because, you know, it, even the screws that we put into hempcrete risk um, corrosion. So we use like the special galvanized um, screws. Maybe they don't, I don't know why they don't use wood inside of um, those blocks. Maybe plastic's just better for mass production and cost is a factor, that's totally possible. Um, but that's, that's really all I can think of. All right, uh, let's see the next one. Oh, mold. Why does mold not grow on it? You mentioned something about that. Yeah. So for the, for both materials, for hempcrete, the alkaline environment of the limestone makes it very impervious to mold. Cement and concrete also doesn't get mold. It's when you introduce the paper on drywall that is good feeding ground for um, mold growth. But when you just have uh, hempcrete, you have like a, a, a limified, basically um, petrified piece of hemp that is now impervious to, to mold growth. And that's because of the high alkaline, high pH of the, of the limestone. Now for hemp wool, it's a very resilient fiber that makes it extremely strong and tough. So the mold can't break down and get a footing inside of that material to then grow. Um, so that's, that's what makes it mold resistant. It's not depending on the shivs themselves that come into hempcrete. You talk about the shiv. You can see like the, the chopped up wooden pieces. These would be susceptible to mold if I were to just put them in a field. They would absolutely rot and, and degenerate. Um, the fibers, which are, are stringier, and those are what comprise hemp wool, those are not. Just the fiber is resilient enough to resist mold growth. And it's also excellent at distributing moisture so that it wouldn't have the problem of, of uh, excess moisture generating mold. Very cool. Uh, the more you talk about it, the more you get a fan. Even more than Very I was good. before. Uh, yeah, well, you knew you said you had seen Maddie present before, and so you had had a preview of what was going Yeah, on. it's like we should be doing this everywhere. Um, okay, what next? Uh, oh, yeah, why hemp over other plant fibers? You touched on this a little bit, like alternatives, but there are lots of plant fibers that um, have been tried before. That is a great question, and – Boy, someone on the chat is probably going to start talking about canaf, I bet, because canaf is a similar, it's a cannabis hibiscus, actually, family of plants, and it's similarly tall growing to hemp. Um, hemp's being grown, and there's a lot of buzz and a lot of interest in growing and processing hemp and getting its many uses. But you're absolutely right. There's corncrete, there's sunflower crete, there's rice crete. That's taking any vegetable stalks, chopping it up, and adding a limestone binder, and then having something that um, will stick together. Even for the wool, um, right here, you know, I actually, I, I, I kidded you guys a little bit. That back there is hemp wool. This is actually jute plant fiber that's made of. So it's a sample from a manufacturing company using the jute fibers. But, uh, you know, I misspoke again. It's actually flax. This is flax. But flax and jute are both uh, bast fiber plants that can be, that means they have long fiber that transports the water up and down the stalk. Those are um, replacements for the fiber. And any type of thick stir suitable for um, the cretes. So you absolutely could have a canaf crete, a sunflower crete, rice crete, um, corn crete. But it's just about okay. Do people are people processing those stocks? Do they have them readily available to use on a job site? Um, and I think ultimately, if you were to have all those plants stacked up to, against one another, few things are going to grow as fast with as little water as hemp. It's just a very easy, naturally growing plant, and so it's going to take less maintenance from a farmer's perspective than a cornfield would. Um, so where, are, where is hemp being grown domestically right now? Good question. I would say Montana has the most acreage. Um, people are growing it for both CBD and long fiber purposes. And, I mean, so you're talking about Montana, Oregon, Colorado, Nevada a little bit. In Washington, Washington's hemp program is up actually, 
because they're so focused on the marijuana side of the plant. Um, but those are the major West Western hemp growers. Kentucky is a very large hemp grower on the East. Uh, Tennessee is also being supportive and constructive in their hemp legislation. So it's very early on to know where hemp growing is going to have the biggest foothold. A lot of cotton trying to grow in industrial hemp. Um, so it, it'll, it'll depend. Most important to consider is, okay, I've got this industrial hemp harvest. Where am I getting it processed? Because you can't just show, send um, raw biomass to us and we make building products out of it. It needs its components, which are the shiv, the inner wooden core, and then the fiber, which there's actually a little bit of fiber mixed in here. I can show you what that looks like. So you see that stringy, the string stuff is fiber. The more sturdy stuff, that's shiv, that's wooden core. Now I got it on my computer for that. <laughs> <laughs> so actually you touched on it there's another question that um, ties it to you know uh, Tom Balderson was asking about the waste from the marijuana growers um, you know is there you mentioned that you know some states are so focused on marijuana right now mm -hmm. um, but yeah what about all the parts of the plant that they're not using for the marijuana Can you know, that be I, used? yep I, I don't I don't want to move out of my boundaries and say that marijuana plants have biomass that's suitable for making uh, building products. But I will say CBD plants, which are marijuana, that they're short and bushy, they're just the male-female uh, dichotomy. Um, you can. It was previously thought that you couldn't use CBD plants to make hempcrete or hemp wool. It's really a matter of the processing. So when you have a short bushy plant that has a lot of branches, accessing that fiber and shiv is going to be a lot of work. You have to strip off those branches and then you're just getting a very small yield of plant matter. Whereas if you have a tall industrial plant and you've got it grown very densely and uh, there's a lot of fiber and stalk in that plant, you are much more efficient processing wise. So each of the, you know, the inside of a CBD plant is just as good as the inside of a, a long fiber plant. It's just how can you efficiently access that, that inside a uh, shiv and fiber. Now, I don't know about the shiv and fiber of the marijuana plant. I know there's biomass because people are stripping off the flowers and buds. Um, but I, I just, I, I haven't been shown that, that to work. I've seen the CBD fiber work for hempcrete as well as hemp wool. Um, but I have not seen the marijuana plant biomass do anything. All right. So we're going to do two more questions. I realize um, we're a little bit after one o'clock and um, so I don't want to go too far over time. So I'll do two more quick questions and then we'll wrap this part of it up. Uh, Tommy is going to be at the um, at the uh, table. I think it's labeled High Mountain Bungalow. And so you can mm -hmm. continue to ask questions of him there, there but I, I don't want to cut into some of the networking, uh, socializing time that some of the other uh, participants wanted to engage in. So a uh, couple more questions here. Which hemp products require specialized training for installation? Um, that's a good question. I would say if you're familiar with flooring products, you're not going to have difficulty with hemp wood flooring. It's a tongue and groove system. If you're familiar with insulation or really you can just put these panels into a, a cavity, you won't have trouble with hemp wool. Hempcrete is a little bit of a, a craft. You need to know when it looks like it's properly mixed. You need to know uh, when it looks like it's properly cured. Um, if you're plastering, that's a little bit of an art in its own. So I would say hempcrete is the one that takes the most training, which is kind of why when we bring people out to Idaho for contractor training, we spend most of our time talking about hempcrete and visiting hempcrete projects. And you know, we've taught workers in an afternoon how to use hemp wool and they've successfully installed it. But hempcrete just takes a little bit of experience with the material. All right. And then last question. Um, this is from Martha Rose. Uh, she wants to know about the cost. The Shot Creek version seems the most intriguing. What's the estimated hmm. cost? Good question. So we cost hempcrete by the cubic foot. A lot of people, they say, like, I'm building a 2,000 square foot house home. How, or home. how much is it going to cost for hempcrete? And the answer is, what does your building envelope look like? What depth of wall do you want? And what is the square footage of your walls? Because then we know the volume of hempcrete we need to provide. Typically, hempcrete install is between $22 and $26 per cubic foot. You're going to get lower, and that's you know with the labor, with the ship those are just data points that we've seen on our own projects. But um, if you're skewing towards a sprayed or panelized system, your labor cost is going to be less. You'll be more towards the $22 end of that range. Whereas if you're cast in place and you're going to be on site for three weeks, uh, you're going to be paying a lot of labor and potentially as high as $30 per cubic foot. 
All right. Okay, with that, we're going to close Q&A, and um, I'm going to go back out of presentation mode. So attendees, that means that we'll go back to that floor plan that you were seeing before, and you can migrate around the tables, um, you know, connect with people. And if you want to talk further with Tommy, he's going to be at the High Mountain Bungalow table. I want to point out that um, there might be a lot of people that want to talk to him. If you see open seats there, feel free to go there. If it is all full, um, keep an eye on that. If you've been there for a long time and you're kind of hogging the spots, you know, think about vacating the spot so that somebody else can um, get in to ask some questions of them. All right. So thank Great. you, Tommy. Um, thanks thank everyone you, for being part of the session and um, see you on the floor. So glad the internet held up. <laughs> yes, I know. I was so worried about that. All right. Yeah, the office internet was down right before we started. Okay. <laughs> no. I'll be headed out.